Welcome, fellow film enthusiast, to a brand new episode of The Director's Viewfinder. I'm your host, Derek Johnson, and I'm excited to take you on an extraordinary journey through the captivating world of filmmaking. As a seasoned filmmaker, producer, and director of photography, I worked on a wide range of projects, from indie gems to TV hits and a ton of commercials. In this podcast, we'll dive deep into the art and craft of filmmaking, pulling back the curtain on the magic that happens behind the camera. This week, I had the opportunity to sit down with producer Paul Phillison, who is the owner of IMI Production Company. Paul comes to me with a great conversation about producing and some wonderful insights about what it takes to be a producer, especially in the commercial marketplace. Paul and I have a lot of shared experiences with our jobs. I'm excited to present the season finale of The Director's Viewfinder. Excited to be here today on the Director's Viewfinder. Um, here we're sitting here with Paul in his home in Seattle. He's uh, here uh, visiting, working, um, and uh, Paul's a producer and a musician. And right. uh, what else do you do? Let's see. I have children, and uh, I'm also a husband. So yeah, two um, more full time jobs. Two more full time jobs. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, and we've been very busy lately we've um we moved to amsterdam a couple years ago Mm -hmm. so our son could go to high school and we uh were there so we thought well might as well open a production company there because we were there and then we uh last year opened a production company in dubai um because we wanted to be able to service that part of the world as as well among Mm -hmm. other things so we keep we keep busy yeah yeah that's yeah. amazing yeah. yeah but it's it's good it's fun yeah and um so you're working primarily with corporate clients yeah we have only done really one narrative job um my entire career we did uh the very secret life of sister k i hope i'm remembering that mm-hmm. uh johan Ligren, uh he's a local filmmaker uh here in seattle uh, I produced uh, that uh, that movie with him. It was a it was a full length uh, feature film, um, shot in one place over in Capitol Hill, uh, and uh, that was the only narrative piece I I ever did. Okay, so, well you know uh, here we here we are in the Pacific <laughs> Northwest, and yeah. I like to tell people always ask me what kind of stuff I work on. And yeah, uh, first thing I say is it's it's the Hollywood of corporate video here. It is. Yeah, um, but, I agree. But what's cool about that is that um, the productions here can be like working on a Hollywood project. Mm. Um, you know, it, it takes all different levels, uh, but essentially the skill sets are the same. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's the same skills, it's the same tools. Mm-hmm. Um, we have great crew up here. You know, I'm quite fond of our of our sweet uh, community, film community up here in Seattle. It does feel like a big family at times. And um, I, I love that about our, our local crew and yeah. great, great creative, great technicians, you know, really, really, really good, you know, film people up here. So because we don't get the narrative work is because, uh, you know, probably some of the, the, the film benefits, you know, haven't been around for a long time. So mm-hmm. we don't, we don't get some of that, uh, narrative work, but still, you know, we've done, we've done our fair share of good work up here. Oh, definitely. Yeah. We have. In fact, yeah. uh, I was down in LA just a couple of weeks ago, um, for work and I met up with a friend of mine who's mm-hmm. a first assistant director in Hollywood, okay. uh, DGA. And we were kind of comparing notes, mm-hmm. you know, between the two marketplaces. And she, I said, well, I mostly am working on commercial stuff, but I want to move into doing some more narrative things. Mm-hmm. She says, well, stay with commercial. You, you know, you won't have to be like me and not have to not work for almost a year. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So there's a lot of benefits to having that as part of, you know, a working, yeah. uh, you know, filmmaker 
people in film. So. Yeah. And the fact, I mean, the thing that I love about freelance too is the beginning, middle, end. And this, the kind of the repetition of being able to, to get out there, put something together, see how well you put it together, and then kind of reiterate and move on and improve where you can, hopefully. Mm -hmm. And when you're doing feature films, obviously, you don't get a ton of those under your belt, you know, uh, too quickly. Uh, not that I don't not, well, I don't want to compare one to the other, but you do get that repetition and beginning, middle, end sequence, you know, mm -hmm. pretty pretty quickly through commercial work. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So mm -hmm. I I like that about it. You know, it's it's cool. Yeah, it's yeah. nice to see the end of a project that you've been working on. For sure. So, I yeah. know. I'm. Right now on the, the end stage of my first feature. And for me, it's like, okay, I'm really ready for the end now. <laughs> so, <laughs> it, so, it keeps on going on and, and on because in commercial work, you don't need to do all of the marketing of mm -hmm. it, right? I mean, right. in our roles, obviously there's a lot of marketing and those are the typically the people who hire us, our marketing teams from, you know, Amazon, Microsoft, the mm -hmm. big, the big companies that are based out of Seattle that we get so much of this work through, mm -hmm. you know, typically comes from marketing dollars, right? Is, is right. where we get engaged. Mm -hmm. But in feature films, right? It's a whole nother life after it gets shot goes on to media houses and promotion, right? Yeah. And, you know, all the different, um, categories are really specialty categories. Mm. You know, if, um, like people that have a finished film want to take it to market mm. a lot of times they end up with a sales agent so mm -hmm. then they let that person do the work and try and get distribution or Got whatever it. Got it. and get into um, festivals to promote it and all yeah, those things right all that stuff yeah, yeah. but for us it's like um in seattle we we maybe have three or four days on a production and and when then we get paid yeah and that's it so. yeah a little bit different on production company side because we have so much of the pitching and pre-production and mm -hmm. and the wrap and all that so we end up being you know three to six weeks maybe on a, on a project right uh compared to uh, you know like a dp or, or a director or something yeah for sure yeah. i mean from the producer standpoint yeah you know it's usually six weeks a couple months yeah you know yeah. from engagement to completion totally so. yeah 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 so and that's kind of been my my sweet spot you know i started off in in rock and roll i did uh tour management and sound engineer for for many years starting off in in new york little clubs and then you know working with major label artists touring all over the place and then eventually I didn't want to be on the road anymore. And so then I transitioned into photo production and then video production and then having my own production company. So it's, it's been, uh, that's kind of always been the, the kind of play box that I was in or sandbox mm -hmm. that I was in was, was production. Mm -hmm. And so I've never lived in, in that side of it where I was a, a, a gaffer or a sound engineer or, you know, a DP or something on set. So, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting because, like, um, that you went from kind of music and, and then into still photography mm -hmm. producing. Mm -hmm. I actually have my background started in fil still photography. Okay. Um, and I uh, was basically a still producer in a studio in Seattle for a long time. Okay. Before I went out and started. Um, pretty much doing my own shoots and okay. live action or stills mostly still okay. still life yeah, and, yeah um i worked for a lot of the fashion companies okay like nordstrom mm -hmm. and um bon marche and stuff so yeah yeah um, Lululemon. That was, Is that I, Seattle? I, didn't do, I think they are here yeah um i didn't work um i didn't work for them but um yeah, I mean, a big part of my job yeah. during that phase was actually more producing. Mm. It was that was probably like three quarters of my job was was being a producer, sure. and then it was like, oh, I actually get to take a picture now. <laughs> so, like, <laughs> you know, how did you find that going from like left brain, right brain, back and forth, and probably when you're did you have a producer on set or on set were you still producing and being the the photographer? Well, I, I work both ways. Okay. Um, I found that I, I felt like because I, 
uh, I, I was a photography assistant for a long time. Mm -hmm. And so I've basically seen almost everything you can imagine, yeah. good and bad. Mm -hmm. And so having that knowledge and that experience, I'm like, I knew how to make a really good production. Nice. So when I handled the productions, I was always really excited because I knew how to do it right. Yeah. You know, with whatever the budget was. Mm -hmm. Um, I was set up at a studio, so we, we knew all the pieces and parts of making a great production. Sure, yeah. And that was the thing I loved about it was like, um, you know, it's like an orchestra. Mm -hmm. You have all these different layers, and they all have to work together to get to a good product in the uh, end. Yeah. So. Yeah, cool. Yeah, so that was my sort of beginning of creative production work. And um, then during that time, I for almost two decades um i always found myself working in new, new technology mm. and uh, and oftentimes on a commercial um or some level of a film project okay uh, whether it was art department or pa or uh, assistant director or I, I just you know independent films you always yeah. kind of move around okay so. yeah um, and what what drove you towards the the new technology sector of our of our world oh uh, well just I love, internal passion yeah I, yeah I love technology okay so All right. um in fact i when i got into the game we didn't really have digital cameras yet yeah, yeah. so i worked on the very first um digital camera that was commercially available in mm. in new york city okay we remember this which was four by five Kodak, I can't remember the model number, but there was like a million wires coming off of it. <laughs> and it was a RGB capture. So you had to take three pictures with three different filters, RGB. Got it. And then the computer would, would take like five minutes to put them together <laughs> to get a final <laughs> picture. It was, awesome. really, it was really something. Yeah. Um, and was the end product commercial grade or was it was that more just for testing and fun and product development um definitely commercial grade okay yeah yeah so and then through that um process of kind of embracing the digital side of, of photography mm -hmm. um you know you kind of I like i got really connected and there's a company called um phase one okay and they created the first ever um uh, flash capture digital backs for medium format cameras oh, okay. and so i actually learned about the digital capture from that company mm. which was uh, i'm so grateful because a lot of that knowledge i still use today cool because uh, it all translates you know working with cameras and yeah, yeah um, sure. you know different digital environments and things yeah so. and it's funny uh, we were just uh over at the office and uh mona our managing director uh her background is in art and uh fine art and photography and she was talking about uh you know she wants to kind of go through all of her old film cameras and just kind of see what's worth keeping maybe what's worth selling and and she's like except my house lot she's i'm gonna i'm gonna keep that one and one day i want to get a digital back for it and she was saying when she first looked at getting a digital back for it, uh, it was $90,000. <laughs> yeah. and, and she just looked and it was like 4,500. So what a ride. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, how far things have come from, from that. So I know crazy. and the <laughs> format sizes too, like even the cameras that we're recording with today, um, you know, the price wise in this, size camera i have an 8k camera for about 4500 yeah um you know five years ago they didn't have 8k cameras no yeah <laughs> no, no and the 4k cameras were 70 grand or something yeah right? like I mean, really out of reach for most of us so. yeah yeah so yeah. accessibility is huge you know and it's kind of interesting now we're having another uh kind of uh round of that with ai right mm -hmm. you know uh, before uh, people were calling around being like oh we have ai you know calling clients and saying 
oh, they have AI as like, it was a sales tool. Like they're the only ones who had this special thing. And I've been joking around with my team saying in a few months, it's going to be like, you know, if I called you, you know, and you're, you're my client and I go, Hey, I've got a camera. They're going to be like, great. Everyone's got a camera. I think it's going to be the same thing with AI. Everyone mm -hmm. is going to have the same AI tools and what it's going to go back to again, instead of relying on the tool, it's going to be creativity and creativity is going to be king, you know? Mm -hmm. So I like that, that this technology can come in and be disruptive, whether it's an 8K camera or AI or, you know, some sweet editing, you know, platform that you have. But at the end of the day, when things normalize, it always comes back to creativity. Right. And because um it has to be someone to operate the technology. Yeah, so. yeah. What what look do you give it? You know, what is the sh what is the concept you're shooting before yeah. you can even bring in someone to shoot it, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like the visionaries, you yeah. know, like as and I'm sure you probably um come across this too, like when you're working with clients, like you have to bring them a vision mm -hmm. or help them create their vision. Yeah. Um, so it's just another tool, but your job is still going to be the same. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. so I like that. I like that that hasn't kind of been put up for sale yet. Yeah, I know. I, <laughs> I want to go back to that. Um, you started telling me when I arrived that yeah. um, story about producing. I can't remember what it was. Uh, oh yeah, so I kind of I went over it quickly, but um, in uh, in 2010 we moved up to Seattle, and uh, we were living down in California, and my wife got a job at Amazon, and uh, so we we moved up here, and at that point I was still tour managing and doing sound for bands, uh, but. I was kind of at the end of that. I've been doing it for about 10 or 11 years. You know, we had our kids and I just didn't want to be away from home. So, um, I, I was able to transition into, like I said, photo production and then ultimately video production. Um, and then, uh, I got a kind of a permalance gig at Amazon. I was there for, for nine months. Um, and so, uh, being there, it was when Amazon really started uh, kind of getting into running their own commercial productions. Uh, it was uh, at, down at uh, Amazon Galaxy Studios that's, uh, that's in downtown Seattle. And, you know, Amazon is, of course, this massive company. And they were applying their, uh, their typical procurement terms to video production. So it's fine if it takes five weeks to go out and, you know, buy a million books, but it's not fine when you need to rent a camera lens and, you know, you need to go do a shoot in a couple of weeks and there's no way you're going to know what camera lens you need, you know, four weeks before you even know you're going to shoot. So, uh, it was a tricky time being being down there, and yeah. so and you said to get just to rent the lens. How long did it take? Five weeks. Five weeks. Yeah, wow. to go from tax, from from budgeting, and then it has to go through tax, legal, finance, back to tax. It's like their whole procurement process, which yeah. makes you, know, you wonder how they even function. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, like I said, yeah. for buying books or buying widgets you know whatever they're buying it's fine because when they finally arrive you put them on the website and you sell them and it's it's all good but mm -hmm. for video production you know a lot of big corporations that we work with amazon microsoft at&t t-mobile boeing costco they're we're fortunate that they're all based up here in seattle so there's a lot of this commercial work that we've talked about it, it all comes from those marketing teams uh, and really floods this market with a lot of commercial opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, but those big, I mean, they're mammoth, like some of the biggest companies in the world, they just don't move at the speed of production, as we know. Mm -hmm. So um, I was able to talk to my supervisor um, and instead of going full time at Amazon, get my creative service agreement and knowing a lot of Amazon's pain points, I was able to kind of craft a production company to suit 
what they would need to be able to move as quickly as, as production. So that was the beginning of me moving out of being a freelance video producer into being a production company owner. Um, and uh, so that was kind of the beginning of, of IMI, uh, our production company. Yeah, that's yeah. really cool. Yeah. yeah, it was like, you know, the old business adage, see a need, fill a need, mm -hmm. you know, so. Uh. <laughs> yeah, and so now that's what you're doing. And it's, that's what I do, yeah. And that's awesome. Yeah, you know, it's uh, it's, you, it's interesting, yeah. Do you have a favorite um, project that you've worked on? Mm, well, I do, and uh, it's, a, it's a project that unfortunately just ended uh, about five months ago. But um, it was, uh, so October 2020, we're, you know, right kind of at the, at the beginning of the, of the pandemic, you know, as far as, okay, that was wrong. It wasn't the beginning of the pandemic. I know it was March 2020, but it was the beginning of people in the production world beginning to figure out how do we get back on our feet? You know, what are we going to do in this new world of, of COVID and, and, you know, having set medics on set, you know, just to take people's temperatures and mask regulations and all these rules and regulations and laws that were being put into place so we could get back to work. Mm -hmm. Um, and I get a call from one of my contacts at Amazon saying, we have a five week shoot that we want to do. I go, okay. Um, you know, how am I going to, how am I going to put this together? And just like we always do as producers, we just start, right? Yeah. You don't always know where you're going to go, but you just start and you start figuring out how to get to where you need to be. Mm -hmm. Um, so we, we did that five week shoot and it went really well. And they decided that they wanted to continue on with this project. And that five week shoot turned into a two and a half year gig, which, as we know in Seattle up here, never really never happens. Of, yeah, anywhere really. I mean, for yeah, any... I mean, unless you're doing episodics in yeah. LA and you know you're going in to just like, you know, mm -hmm. a long, long, you know, run. But, mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, so it was an insane ride. And, and we didn't just do production. We ended up expanding all of these services that we do from, uh, from staffing to, uh, equipment procurement, rentals, purchases, um, just we did everything for Amazon for those two and a half years on that stage. So we basically took over Pacific Grip and lighting mm -hmm. uh, uh, down by Boeing Field and, yeah. and we built it out for them. And mm -hmm. we had an always on studio. Uh, our crew was between like 25 and 50, depending on where we were at, you know, in the cycle, we ended up doing all the post-production for them as well. Yeah. And, and yeah. a lot of my friends yeah. worked over there during that time. Okay. Um, Can I ask you? Uh, Regan. Okay. Production designer. Yeah. Yeah. And um, Nikki Smith, G&E. Um, yeah. I think who else was the other guy? It was G&E. I, I mean, Kevin. I, Kevin. Yeah, Kevin. Um, yeah. Yeah, there's, you know, like you said, 25. I'm sure yeah. there was probably a good percentage of people that I knew. Yeah. That, I, you know, cause yeah. I mean, I work with all freelancers. So. Oh, totally. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. And it was great. We had a, an, and of course, Yulia who's sitting right over there. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 And uh, it was, um, yeah. So that was my favorite job I've ever done just cause one, the duration of it, it created all these new opportunities to learn and, um, it gives you a chance to kind of sink in, right? Yeah. Like really hone in on what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. so from a, from a creative perspective, from a crew perspective, I love systems and processes. And, and so we were able to continually iterate our policies and procedures and for our clients too, you know, they had a lot of really unique needs because all of a sudden we're really like an extension of them. You know, we're not, you know, we're, I guess let's forget production companies. We're always an extension of them to a degree, but like you said, it lasts a few days. And so it's kind of, you know, you dip in and you dip out and you're, of course you're doing the best to support them along the way, but over two years of shooting, like, you know, your, your operating systems and your, um, your financial systems, like all get dovetailed into, you know, more and more refined ways for the client to be able to 
you know, reconcile things on their side. So it was just very interesting to kind of get that level of, of deep dive. Yeah, so, yeah, that's super cool. I'm glad that you had the opportunity to work on, at that level. Yeah, so. that was cool. Yeah. Um, so do you, so how long have you been producing then? Well, do you consider my, my touring? Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, I would say I mean, so. Yeah, yeah. I, that started in 1998, so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, older. I think that's maybe longer than Yuli has been alive. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so about twenty-five years or yeah. something like that. You know, yeah. from tour managing drunk adults to mm-hmm. yeah sober directors <laughs> <laughs> to boring corporates. <laughs> no, okay. A funny story is that I remember the the very first shoot I ever did. I, I mean, so I just gotten back from tour managing Surfer Blood in Brazil, where where we basically I wouldn't say they're bodyguards, but they were guards because it wasn't safe for uh, for us just to be walking around the city. That we were told, I don't I don't know if that was true or not. I um you know, but anyway, that's what the story was, and we were kind of all kept in a in a van. And then I got back and I started doing this this gig with Voda Studios and we were producing Eddie Bauer laydowns. Mm-hmm. So maybe I shouldn't say this on film, but when you go from tour managing a rock band to shooting laydowns, uh, one is less exciting than the other. Yeah. And um, but what was amazing is that I sent out my call, my first call sheet, you know, first call sheet I ever did. And everyone showed up and I'm like, this is the easiest fucking job in the world. All you have to do is send out a piece of paper and everyone shows up and does their job yeah. compared to dragging drunk adults out of, you don't want to know where to do. You don't know what you don't want to know what. Right. So, uh, yeah. Anyway, yeah. Yeah. I always a little different experience, very, yeah. very different experience. So it's similar to kind of compare that in my uh, journey. I was working in New York city with all these fabulous clients and, you know, kind of a really living the dream out there. Yeah, yeah. And then when I moved to Seattle, my first job was teaching photography to senior citizens out in Issaquah. Okay. <laughs> so it's like <laughs> a little bit slower pace, a little slower pace. And, um, but you know, I actually really enjoyed teaching. Yeah. Um, and I really enjoyed the producing too. Yeah. It's not that, but it's just so funny to get that juxtaposition totally of totally different experience, totally different and experience, it's, but to your point, using the same skill set. Yeah, essentially, yeah. That's, you know, kind of customer service and yeah. taking care of people. and um, Exactly. Yeah. I, I always say my my kind of superpower is finding the right person to do the job and making sure it gets done properly. Like if I had to boil yeah. down producing to like the simplest essence, and um, I think that's really it. And then when you expand upon that, like creating great teams, right? Mm-hmm. That was something that people at Halo always said is like it felt like a family i mean like the first thing that they all did the first thing that they all did when they heard that halo was going away is they all went out together and you know went out for a drink you know so it's like they they could have been like okay that sucks but you know i can't wait to just get away from all these people that i've been stuck with and no they they came together they They always they're still in touch we still hear from them big rap party yeah Yeah. i mean because you know that's it's cool to work in uh, with a group of people that are kind of on the same mission, yeah, you know, and then they find a way to bond and, and make it all work together. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, of course, you got to go out and have a beer. I mean, sure. Yeah. You know. I know. But it is cool to see teams and, and, and people really, you know, bond over mm-hmm. their work and because it is, it is still a creative endeavor at the end of the day, yeah. you know, and I find whether I'm in the recording studio doing something creative or, or on set shooting something creative. Um, there's like a nice chemistry and magic that kind of happens between people who are sharing their creative energy and vision, you know, cause you don't know what you're going to do when you get there. Mm-hmm. You know, we all know how to, you know, you know, turn on the lights and turn on the cameras and like there's, but then like, again, the creative approach is like this, this great, kind of equalizer right that yeah yeah because there is uh, there is still sort of a level of um of discovery that happens yeah once you basically put the the team together 
how, what's going to happen? What kind of things are you going to face? Yeah. You know? Um, and, and that's where I think like for me on producing, a, you try and solve as many problems as you can. And then when, when things get out of the gate, it's like, it's like your job is almost done mm. at that point. So, yeah. You know, the, the guy, uh, his name was Thomas O'Keefe who, who taught me how to tour manage, uh, at the time he was tour managing train. I think now he tour manages Weezer. Uh, but my friend of, a he was a friend of a friend and he basically got me on the phone for three hours and taught me how to tour manage. And, um, uh, he said, you know, you can, you can plan for 90% of it, but 10%, you just got to have that skill to be able to, to, to deal with what comes up. And I think that's producing's easy if everything goes well, but where we make our money is in that 10% when everything falls apart and you got 50 people looking at you and the client's there and the clock's ticking and you got to figure something out like that's that's the magic of producing that yeah. that's where you gotta get that mojo mm -hmm. it that really is true i mean there's you know i've had a couple of big projects that definitely started to go south and <laughs> you know all of a sudden like okay i'm gonna fix this yeah. you know and if you figure out if you you have enough experience behind you and you have enough support in your network usually you can you can figure it out Totally. Yeah. No, that's yeah. Which should lead me to my next question. <laughs> what was the I worst, coming. <laughs> the worst job? What's the worst job for a project? And yeah. You don't have to name clients or anything. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see. Let me think about that for a second. Um, I'll just do the one that's coming top of mind. Cause it was, yeah, it was, a, it was a challenging moment. Um, we uh we and this i'm going to preface this by saying it was young in my producing career and and i got myself into trouble by saying yes to something i didn't know i should have said no to so what it was is i basically agreed to produce a two-day shoot in one day and uh it was just way too many shots to to get through and um it basically came down to where i had to break out first of all at lunch we were way behind and so i said okay let's go through and get rid of all the shots that we don't like have to have okay that's not fun to do at lunch mm -hmm. and then getting into the day okay so now we're back on schedule and so now we head into the day and like within an hour we're already behind again so i basically had to take over running the set and just tell the director there was a director duo from la they were up in seattle we had flown up la talent like it was it was for a big tech company up here in seattle and i essentially had to give the director's like 12 minutes per shot and i had to be kind of a jerk to to get it through the finish line yeah and that's the only job that's ever won an award for me oh well, <laughs> well there you go right so it, it got some like ad week award yeah well you, but, you yeah. see the flip side right it's like the brilliant side of that yeah, yeah. you know but yeah. still that was not fun having like you know as and especially as a young producer from Seattle yeah. and all these LA people are up there, you feel like yeah, oh, you, I'm, you feel like as being a producer, yeah, it's like you're it's your ship, yeah. You everyone is looking towards you to see this thing through and not get into trouble, yeah, yeah, and not waste the client's money, right? Like, and I mean, like the directors, they want to bring in their creative vision, and they're like, "What do you mean I only have twelve minutes? Yeah, I need a half hour. Yeah, well, you don't have a half hour, so figure it out. Yeah, you know. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, I don't know. That was a stressful day. Yeah, but I can imagine. <laughs> here we are. I'm still alive. Yeah, 
Like Eddie Vedder said. Yeah. I wish I could say that was my worst experience. <laughs> yeah. What was your worst oh experience? My gosh. <laughs> I've had several. Um, I think, I'm sure I have too, but that was just what popped in my head. Well, I was hired as a production manager for um, a client a production company from LA that had a Washington State um, client. And they had fired the production manager and basically I came on as um, someone who knew a lot of crew so my I, my initial job was to crew the the, um, the production mm -hmm. and the first call was can you help me do a, a travel budget because we need to fly up a 70 person crew Whoa. from LA and I'm like well <laughs> have you tried to find someone in Seattle yet for any of these roles and um they said they didn't know because they had fired the production manager who probably had a good chunk of those roles in place Got well it. i basically went into high gear and i was it was probably the busiest season we've had here in town and everyone was booked Got it. so it was really challenging just to crew up i had to challenge other productions and uh, and ask for more labor <laughs> uh, rates to get this thing crude yeah. but I figured that was cheaper than flying people flying up. people up and housing them and all that so um, uh, we managed uh, or I managed to um, get the whole crew sorted um, but then our gaffer who had some beef with the previous production manager two days before our shoot calls me up and says, um, I got booked on something else. I won't be coming and I'm bringing all of my keys with me. <laughs> so he, he intentionally sabotaged the job, had nothing to do with me personally. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So he took away my G and E department and I had two days in the situation of being how trying how to figure out how to crew people was already difficult. Mm. So I got lucky because I, I, I worked some magic and I ended up um, having um, to split. I had two gaffers um, that helped me because we were trying to do six spots in two days. Mm. Um, and the people from LA were pretty shady. So they were like, well, we're going to be in and out of this one spot in about 45 minutes. And I'm like, what? I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> you can't move your company in 45 minutes to park in that much time. Yeah. So. Um, you know, it was just like this constant uphill battle. Like, yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, shady things happening from people out of town. And I, I mean, I could go on and yeah, on. Yeah. It just, it was a nightmare job. It was like 18 hour days for me, uh, five days in a row, and then two 20 hour days during the shoot days. And um, crazy. I like to tell people the only thing that didn't go wrong on that job was nobody died. <laughs> So like everything else you can imagine going wrong went wrong. Got it. I mean, we had like unions calling me. I had like, yeah, you know, did the caterer show up? Um, we had problems with the catering. You know, there was like, <laughs> I was going to say, it's like the one thing you can do to keep your crew happy. Yeah. Like we had there... second meal, like the pizza shop ran out of pizza. <laughs> <laughs> We're just like, you it's just doing sauce. Like, <laughs> I mean, it was definitely like a, a hard one to get through. Yeah. Um, I mean, I didn't really need to do that job, but yeah. I'm kind of glad that I did because um, now I know like what to look out for if yeah. something like that comes up again. Wow. And I can just, you know, say no thank you. Or, yeah. Or, or put my terms on it before yeah. we start. So, yeah. I mean, but, I, mean I could go <laughs> on for a half an hour and tell you all the things that went wrong. Yeah, yeah. You know? No, but you painted a good picture already. So, yeah. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was trying to think of a worse one, but I yeah. just, I, I haven't, I can't be that lucky that that was the worst thing that's ever happened. But yeah, as you're, as you're speaking, I've had like visceral responses because like I've had some of those things happen before and you're just like, oh, God, it's like that, that terrible feeling because you do not want to go back to, I mean, anyone and, and tell them something can't happen or, 
or whatever, right? You know, it's just oh, like no, you never want to do yeah. that as a producer. Go to your director and be like, you can't do this or, you know, because you want to crush it for for everyone all the time. Yeah, I mean, you want to do a good job and you know that you're working with people that have very specific ideas and their yeah. artistic visions and things. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it was just it was nuts. Like, I remember even at one point, the DP wasn't returning my calls and someone put in an order for two two lens kits we didn't have a budget for two lens kits and of course they ordered the most expensive lens kits yeah. which they didn't need yeah um but then like even just communicating with the the ac locally mm. that i hired yeah he wasn't doing any of that so like you know i myself am also a cinematographer so yeah. i basically managed the cinematography <laughs> when i'm supposed to be the production manager and yeah. i'm calling the ac and you know telling him what to build and um and then we get like a day before our shoot and and um and he's like well i i need a 5k for this one shot and i'm like what <laughs> like, I'm like we can't get you a 5k and like we don't even have crew for that because yeah. okay one light one big light on a location that was exterior also means you need a tow plant and you need a minimum of three crew to work that one light got it yeah and so they these guys were like pushing for this yeah and so <laughs> you know we found a better we found a solution so we could use a small jenny and a light that wasn't quite as powerful but yeah it, um it worked fine so he just, probably didn't need the 5k yeah he didn't need the 5k yeah he could have just shot daylight it would have been fine <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah i mean it's it gets into um you know problem solving can be really a an art form in itself for sure you know and as much Absolutely. as you can do before you go in um certainly helps the the end result so, yeah absolutely yeah. dream for the production company so you just opened yeah. another space yeah a, another location well, uh yeah so we have um amsterdam uh, and dubai mm -hmm. open now and um you have studios there too uh or no just, just uh office, right? yeah offices and yeah. and resources you know uh and so uh the yeah the the dream would would be to be able to serve any client globally. I mean, that's always kind of been the vision, you know, global production services. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, that's that's the focus. I just want to be able to pick up the call and say, yeah, we can do that there. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you know, when we started IMI, one of the taglines was uh, locals everywhere. And I still kind of lean on that, you know, I, I like that. My network has always been kind of my my really valuable, you know, asset that I that I bring around, and so I think that's that's the vision. Yeah, cool. yeah. It's, yeah, it's exciting. Yeah, it is. I like traveling. Mm -hmm. It's always been part of what I've done, you know, through bands and and productions, and and I love meeting new people and new cultures, and and uh, this is very geeky, like production, you know, stuff, but. I like how production rules are different in North America than they are in a different country. And like your production rules are different in Amsterdam than they are in France, than they are in Dubai, you know, so. Yeah, having, I, I was thinking that too, because, yeah. you know, just like um, incentives and, and just the general way that people work. Exactly. You know, cultural differences and. Um, yeah, and just like the, you know, you know, here we have 10 hour shoot days with a half hour lunch. So you're on set for 10 and a half hours, right? Mm -hmm. You know, in Amsterdam, it's portal to portal. So you really have to, as a producer, think about, okay, where am I hiring my crew from? You know, is there another crew member in, in The Hague that's closer to the location so I don't burn, in, you know, an hour and a half of their travel time? You know, so it's just another level of logistical Jenga you know yeah. uh, to figure out and in and, and France you know they're on eight hour days but they get like seven breaks and you know it's like 
you maybe get five or six hours of shoe time out of a production crew in in France because um, they're more you know social uh, approach to to employment. So it's just like you you got to know that stuff. It's super important. Like if you didn't know that and you went to go you know crew up and do a shoe in France and you didn't have this this knowledge, you would you can you make some burnt. really expensive yeah. mistakes. Yeah, because you could get into a lot more days yeah you know or, or overtime and plus there's a 30 percent uh social like uh like you know our um our p and w you know they their uh their social uh kind of vat is you know at 30 percent. so all these like very minutia level details that you just got to know so i kind of like that stuff for some reason yeah um mm-hmm. And it's super valuable to clients too, right? You can, if you have all that, you know, encyclopedic uh, knowledge and you can kind of help them through choosing where to, where to best shoot and stuff is, hmm. it's good when it comes to global production work. So, yeah, cool. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time today. You're um, welcome. It's been great to talk yeah. and learn about White Trap too. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Yeah. It's been a great season, my first season of the podcast. I'm so glad you hung on to this with me with this last uh, conversation. Uh, really enjoyed talking to Paul. He was very insightful. We certainly have shared quite a bit, and I I am inspired by Paul, and I expect to do some more producer chats. Um, Maybe we'll have Paul back on or some other producers. I'm already lining up some great things for 2024. Uh, I have a wonderful actress, um, which we'll be leading with our first episode next year, who was on Star Trek recently. So I'm super thrilled about that. And um, also, uh, in my own world, uh, I have uh, have several movies on the um, film uh, festival circuit and uh, some other things in development. So uh, please stay connected. Uh, We would love to hear from you if you have anything you want to hear about or if anybody wants to submit uh, or be on the on the show. We are actively uh, looking for uh, topics and uh, people to talk with. So uh, we will uh, uh, reconvene um, early uh, or late January, twenty twenty four. See you then.